This author, who began his song with a call to pleasure, followed by a meditation on violence in the pagan world, switches after recounting the life of the martyred saint to this dispiriting reminder that violence can only ever beget more of the same, and that violence inflicts one side and the other. His saint is one who imitates her lord, thinking him unique, but she is matched by pagans who do exactly the same thing, all craving the blessing of a sovereign. The sovereigns, meanwhile, and in both cases, pagan and Christian, are so anxious about their status that they rely on violence to put an end to violence. Faith's sacrifice is supposed to ensure the well-being of her land and its people, but it is ultimately unable to undo the links between mimetic desire and violence. Her story is instead a reminder of its ravages. So why is it that this early Occitan text takes the trouble to reveal the mechanism of victimization only to deny its power to undo that violence? To return to the Girard citation that I quoted at the start of this paper, great writers apprehend intuitively and concretely through the medium of their art the system in which they were first imprisoned. We might say that our author, our author only too well understands the workings of mimetic desire and the prison in which it holds us. In the Council de Santa Fe, that desire is voracious, mutating when disempowered to, so as to resurrect in another form and afflicting both sides of the conflict. Even the impulse to imitate and worship the sovereign is embedded in tangled economic hierarchies that subordinate one mimetic practice, victimization, to another, economic well-being born of competition over a holy relic. La Canto di Santa Fe may remind us, may provide us with a rare 11th century reading of this operation, but it's often never really claims that revelation alone can lead to reformation. On the contrary, he suggests that the violence that gives rise to and defends the inviolability of the sacred is no different from the violence that gives rise to the political. Rather than try to separate out these two domains as incommensurable as we are often wont to do, we should instead listen more closely to the text itself. A text that reveals not that violence can be overcome by sacrifice, as it would be in a myth, but that violence can never be overcome so long as both discourses, the religious and the political, feed on the blood that gives rise to their institution and in which they lay their claims to exist. Thank you. say something of what it resonates with, you know, what are uh, my, the things I, I know, like, it, the, the way in which also like something I've been thought of like with, with, with Per Paolo and other is how Imitazio Christi in, in, in Dante, in Purgatorio, plays a major role, like, for the self. So, like, so, like, so what, what I, I would have been looking at is not the sort of, like, social context, but what the act of imitation plays for Faith, uh, in, in this case, for faith of self, uh, and the, I mean, at least what, what we think we, one could find in, in the sort of like process uh, that Dante describes in Purgatory would be that Imitatio Christi is precisely a way through external mediation. You know, it's a sort of like positive way to use models to change and to break that pattern. Mm -hmm. you know? So I wonder, you know, like whether that in, in the text there is also like a, or maybe, I mean, I, I, I can see why there should be, but I wonder yeah. whether there is also like a, a sort of a, a meditation on what takes place within faith or self. There isn't, but you raise an interesting point because it, it really revolves around the, the question of whether Christ is an external or internal mediator. And in this text, we get very little about faith herself. We, we, she, she really speaks only when provoked or to do these sort of set rhetorical pieces about how she wants to die. We, we hear nothing about her, I mean, her major decision to give up not only her family and her identity. So, I mean, in Imitatio Christi leads to whatever identity she has at the end of the text, mm -hmm. that is, as, as a young martyr. But she's, in, in the process, given up every bit of her social identity, you could say in order to take on something else, which she sees probably as a, as a, as a rival social identity. But Christ, the, the, the figure that she's imitating, is very much an external figure, it seems to me. But that's because we don't hear her discuss 
what she thinks she's doing mm -hmm. when she yeah. follows that invitation. Yeah. And I guess it's also because the text was saying it's written in, in the 11th century, yes. so maybe there was another interest. That, uh, yes, it could, it could yeah. well be, yes. And I also wanted to ask, when does the, 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 the story take place? I mean, what, what, it, it recounts a story that, what, when was it dated? It's supposed to be taking place in the 7th century. 7th century, yeah. 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 And, so, and there is a much older Latin text, of course. Yeah. But of course, what's most interesting about these vernacular texts is they take these Latin texts and then spin them yeah. and double the size and add all kinds of things that you wouldn't have expected to be in there. And there's lots of them in this book. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Could I just comment that uh, the, the case you've given us, very um, interesting and delicate reading, seems to be the case of ambiguity in betwixt and in between. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you say that uh, the saint's sacrifice doesn't undo the links between mimetic desire and violence. God himself is partly an archaic god, um, and the saint imitates the pagan. These are aspects of ambiguity or mixity or yes. hybridity. Yep. And I'm wondering if you haven't actually uh, given us an answer there to your initial question, why isn't she not more interested in the Middle Ages? Yes. <laughs> Which yes, is course. precisely, yes. it goes back to an ambiguous case. And yes. if I think about what she does say about the Middle Ages, um, it is about uh, victim intercourse, which are partly emergent from the mechanism uh, of the sacrificial victim and the founding murder and the deceitful myth that disguises it yeah. and so on. Uh, or else they're about reversion to the archaic sacred within Christianity. And I'm wondering if you haven't given us an example of that, and if, if you haven't actually explained why he are holds the Middle Ages. I, some I think you're absolutely right. Yes. No, when, when he does <laughs> but there's a point for deign Brian. to visit the Middle Ages, he, it's, it's a much clearer that the ambiguity yeah. isn't here, Guillaume yeah. de Machaut or Chrétien de Troyes, Yvain, he does a reading of the end, which is a wonderful reading. But of course, it's much clearer, and it fits, fits the pattern. What, of course, interests me here is that it sort of scrambles the pattern up. Medieval syntaxis could be seen as a form of uh, external and internal mediation, in a sense that there is an agonistic uh, uh, mimicking of uh, the sacrifice of, of Christ. I mean, sometimes they want to un un undo, I mean, outdo Christ uh, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in the way that they want to be sacrificed. I mean, in a sense, it's a martyrdom that is not, uh, you know, they don't, don't suffer as a martyrdom, but they, they, they wish to be marked in a yes. sense. Yes. So it's, it's, it's a form of uh, wrong imitation of, uh, of uh, Christ. I mean, they want to go. They want to go beyond. Christ. Beyond, exactly, Sometimes exactly. They want a better death. Yeah. They want. They want five deaths. I mean, they, it's just a, they're insatiable. <laughs> um, so it's a mutation which is internal, it, some somehow. It, it you know, exactly. they, they, they 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 want to to, to outdo yes. yeah. Christ. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, just to 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 respond to that, you mentioned something about this sort of competition between faith and the pagans, mm. in the sense that they were each sort of trying to outbid each other in their acts of charity. Yes. Uh, it's sort of like a potlatch, you know, in a way. Yeah. Yes. So there's an escalation there. I don't know if that's sort of thematized or if that's something you kind of picked out. Uh, it isn't thematized really, but of course, yeah, it, it is only thematized in, in the discussion of her family, because obviously she, this is the, the one of the ruling families, and it, it's definitely in a potlatch gift economy where it's it's her duty to give. And so she, she gives, but in defiance of how she's supposed to give. So she, it's, it's always, a, in, in terms of the social structure that she's been born into, she imitates her family, but always again with a twist, so that it, it further enrages everyone who watches her, including including other Christians, perhaps. Because they're, they're going to suffer, because her family has ceased to provide the economic wealth that they would have. 